Hello, friends. My name is Pastor Christopher Morundi. I'm the director of the Lutheran Institute of Regenerative Agriculture, and it's my great joy to have again with me uh, Kimberly Clark, uh, the assistant professor of ag science at Concordia University in Seward, Nebraska. And we've, uh, as you've seen through our Facebook page and uh, perhaps I think of maybe promoted a few other places as well there, uh, where there's a little bit of a burgeoning relationship between what we're doing in Lyra and what's going on at Concordia, Nebraska's ag program. Looking forward to seeing uh, where the Lord takes that uh, in the years to come. A very, very exciting uh, connection that we're uh, that we're putting together. I remember I, I was just finishing my term, uh, my two years of teaching Old Testament at Concordia Seward, right when this whole ag program was introduced. And so it, it's really cool to hear be on the other end of it and and see it coming together. So if you watch friends on the uh, on our first video, we talked a little bit more about we talked in great detail about about the program itself, what what they're doing at Concordia Seward. And now I want to get more into into agriculture itself and and discuss a few topics with Kimberly here. Um, then the first one I want want uh, want you to address, Kimberly, is uh, the state of ag. I mean, as you look over the landscape uh, here in 2023, what are the challenges and opportunities that are facing your students that are facing uh, the next generation um, as they go forth from Concordia Seward or 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 anywhere else uh, into into the agricultural world. What what are the challenges and and then also the the great opportunities? Oh goodness, I feel like that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so I would say I'm going to touch on the bigger challenges that we're seeing. I think is in ag overall, and then the opportunities as well. One of the challenges that, um, I guess, three challenges that come to mind. Um, one is consumer demand and preferences. Two is technology. And three is the size of family-owned farms and ranches. So those are the three that I would say are the biggest challenges. Um, what's interesting is with social media and YouTube and other technologies, um, we're hearing more and more from what consumers are wanting as far as their preferences. And, and um, I'm going to say demands, but not in a completely negative in negative light. They're just voicing their preferences even stronger. And so we're starting to see um, shifts from, you know, conventional foods and products to more of the organics and non-GMOs. And consumers want to know that the products that they're consuming are from family-friendly farms. Um, and that's really, we've actually been having these dialogues over the last decade about how we transition in ag to meet consumer preferences. And so we're starting to see that, but as social media and technology emerge even more from the consumer side, their voices are louder and more pre prevalent. Um, and so now we're determining how much do we shift our ag production to meet these needs. And so we're we're seeing that shift in ag production to different types of production, maybe shifting some of your acres from conventional to organic, or maybe you're shifting from conventional livestock production to an organic production. Um, GMO is another term that we hear a lot. Um, so that's one of the areas. The second area, technology. So I mentioned technology from the consumer's per perspective. From the ag perspective of technology, we are starting to see um, all the data that we can collect and how we can use technology today. And so keeping up with technology and those changes and how we can use them as a farmer is like my head, I think, is spinning half the time just trying to keep up with everything and understand which app do I use and what's the best and um, all of these changes. Um, you know, farmers that irrigate their crops can turn on their pivots from, you know, an app on their phone. If they are raising livestock, livestock have activity monitors where you can see the location of your livestock, how much walking they did if they're laying down. So there's so much data we can collect, but 
really incorporating that technology and data to our to our benefit in ag um, can be challenging. So it's an opportunity, but it's a challenge at the same time. Um, and then our third part is the size of family farms. Uh, so if you want to make a, a living wage in agriculture, um, we've seen family farms grow in size. Um, they want several of their kids to be working on the family farm. Well, what comes along with that is you need to increase the number of animals you're producing. Maybe you need to diversify, add more acres and add more animals. And so just being able to keep up with meeting um, the family needs based on the number of individuals that are there to earn the living wage is challenging. And so we've seen a number of small producers, so just a handful, 100 animals or less, um, if they're raising or maybe they're renting their land and um, that rent contract is up and they don't have land to rent anymore for, for crop production. And so really deciding how you want to grow, if you want to grow, continuing on is another challenge that we've been seeing. Now, the great thing is, uh, because I'm a glass um, half full perspective, all of those challenges are opportunities that our next generation can really capitalize on and use um, to their benefit. Um, and so uh, one of the classes I just wrapped up was farm and ranch management. And initially students went into the course thinking it was all about farm accounting. Well, it's about how you're gonna manage your farm and produce um, a living wage for your family and maybe the next generation and making those plans now so that you're prepared for changes of you know, technology and consumer demands in the future. So really we can change all of those challenges into opportunities. And that's what we're really focusing on here is don't look at those challenges as barriers, but instead look at them, look at those challenges as opportunities for growth in your future. I I would, can I add one to the list that I'd like you to comment on just real briefly? Uh, someone mentioned to me, and I, I, I mentioned this to Dr. Brink and he nodded, so it must be a statistic that's widely available, uh, that uh, uh, the average age, the median age of a farmer now is like 67. And so, so how a, we are, uh, we are getting close to huge land transfer. Uh, what do they call it? the greatest land transfer in history? Uh, as as all these guys are getting towards retirement age, and very few farmers have an exit plan, um, and and their kids have you know gone off and done other careers, or they're in Des Moines or Omaha or or a major city somewhere, Kansas City. And and there there's there's nothing nothing there for them. So I, I see that again as a challenge. But then also, how can all those acres that no one knows what the future is for? How can they be leveraged for addressing the kinds of things that you you spoke about earlier? Absolutely. So we are seeing like that average age right around sixty seven for. Um, the average landowner and livestock producer. And so what what happens in the future? So again, that's a challenge that um, I'm going to speak about. It's an opportunity for our students. And so um, I think that really ties into well some of the major conversations I had in the farm and ranch management course with students this past semester. Um, we spent quite a bit of time focusing on a succession plan. And initially, students thought of it as a will, but then I said, but then through conversations, they understood, you know, why we need a succession plan and what that means. You know, and I understand that not all of the children are gonna go back to the farm. They maybe wanna be to the city, they wanna focus on a different career, and that's no problem because we have students in our program who, whose family doesn't farm, but they're interested on the agriculture side. And I can think of um, at least three students in our program that don't come from that farming background. So they don't have any land to go home to or livestock to go home to. And, I, and so the perfect opportunity is we have a number of landowners who are looking to do something with their land, um, not to have it urbanized so it stays in agriculture, 
and they're willing to work with you. Um, work with you on a long-term lease or do a rent-to-own type lease. So there's opportunities there. But individuals need to have an open mind about where they're going to be located. So if you want to go back to where you grew up and farm with them, but if you have an open mind and you're willing to um, expand your area, there are, I can, I can place students with a number of farms right away. What, as we, as this whole conversation challenges opportunities now, now, of course, uh, you know, but by our very title, the Lutheran Institute of Regenerative Agriculture is, is um, alternative, ag I don't know if that's the right term, alternative agriculture, whatever, um, uh, smaller scale farm to table, which really fits in with what you said, the first challenge and opportunity. How are, and, and I've been seeing some of this, it's really kind of cool to see, how are quote unquote, you know, conventional farms learning from uh, alternative agriculture? How are some of these techniques coming back and forth? How, how, can, how can we all get along <laughs> and, and work with one another and learn from one another? I know say that's a huge question. <laughs> Yeah. What is a, such a blessing about being in agriculture is we do learn from each other, whether it's neighbors learning from neighbors or helping neighbors or conventional um, working and learning about some of the practices of, say, organic or regenerative ag. And uh, we actually there are a number of practices in place that even conventional producers, while they may not be thinking about it, um, have for sustainability or regenerative or um, looking at some, um, I guess, benefits from the environmental standpoint. One of them that I can think of that has been transitioning over the number of years is going to a no-till system. Um, and so working on the no-till system and uh, initially, you know, back in um, before my time, you know, I think in the 80s and maybe even early 90s, um, tillage was a, a big thing to keep the weeds down and disease, reduce disease, disease and everything. Well, through continued research and practices, they said, you know what, that's not the best for the soil health. You can still get your same quality and quantity of, of, of crops by going to a no-till system. And so no-till is one, but cover crops has probably been some of the most recent discussions. And I, I see you really nodding your head, um, probably in agreement. I'm sure you know all about cover crops and you probably utilize them on your farm. Um, but we're starting to see cover crops. And so while there's many health benefits, we're also talking about with cover crops, um, you may not need to terminate your cover crop. Maybe you can turn that cover crop into a secondary cash crop, even um, while also adding soil benefits and benefits to the environment. And then because of that cover crop, diseases are reduced and weeds are reduced and probably pests at the same time. And so really learning these practices from others and incorporating them. And while conventional producers may not see it as organic practices, that's exactly how organic producers function and operate is using these cover crops. Um, and so they don't have, so they don't have to use some of the natural, um, natural chemicals uh, within their organic systems. Do you, do you challenge students to kind of, kind of explore different, uh, uh, different ways of doing things than perhaps uh, maybe they grew up with and uh, uh, that they, that they always see around them? Yeah, and interesting, I don't have to say it. I can bring in guest speakers and just showing their different perspectives. Um, so in this past spring, I um, taught a crop management course and I brought in a couple of guest speakers. Um, they didn't come in at the same time because their schedules didn't work out, but one was a, um, a crop consultant and the other one was an extension agent. And the crop consultant said, I'm looking to maximize production. Um, and so we're going to field crop 
we're going to field scout. And if we see diseases or pests and we need to control for those, we're going to go ahead and do that. Versus the extension uh, educator said, I'll go out and field scout with you as well. But if we're if we're just seeing a little bit of disease or some weeds or pests, we're going to hold off on doing anything because we don't want to apply um, any chemicals that we don't need to until until we need to. And so while we always talk about it, hearing those two perspectives, he having the students hear those two perspectives sparked some great discussion and understanding of we don't have to treat right away. It's okay to hold off and it's okay to incorporate um, uh, maybe some more sustainable organic practices. So these two guest speakers also talked about cover crops and one said, you know, it's not my first choice. And then the other individual said, cover crops are great because they're gonna help me reduce my costs because I'm not applying as much chemical I'm saving time um, and for a number of other reasons. And so that really generates discussion. And then as a facilitator of learning is how I view myself, I can say, now what changes would you make on going back to the family farm based on these discussions you heard? And is there anything you would recommend to your parents about some of the practices? And so just hearing those different perspectives really helps bring everything 360 for the students to take into consideration and see how everything evolves. And, and I think a lot of these, like you said, they're not, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, some of these practices aren't necessarily, you know, wild and out there. I mean, people, people were doing cover crops, you know, back, you know, 75 100 years ago you know a lot of these crops were done done quite regularly and even even today you know it, a big a big uh point of regenerative ag is animal impact on on the managed animal impact well a lot of farmers still put their cattle out on the on the stocks uh in the fall so i mean that's that and and no till like you said so 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 a lot of these are not necessarily way out there it's just maybe thinking through you know what 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 does this all mean and uh and how can we maybe maximize this even more and i think people are thinking a lot more about soil health and they're thinking a lot more about water especially in nebraska um i mean the aquifer is still pumping but uh but that's certainly something that that people are very very concerned about Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's interesting to see how there's been shifts in thought processes and practices from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, there's always going to be farmers or individuals that prefer to use the same practices their grandparents did or their father did. Um, but, you know, over time through science and what we know and what we're learning and um, a peer-to-peer -peer learning process, we're seeing more and more of these changes and, sh changes and shifts. And so just more cognizant of um, how can I reduce the amount of water I'm using, as you had mentioned, and even soil health. And um, I haven't talked a lot on the animal impact on the environment, but we're learning what kinds of feeds we can feed the livestock to meet their nutritional nutritional needs, growth needs, lactation needs, um, all of their needs while maybe reducing an environmental impact. And so all of this takes time. It's not going to happen overnight, but um, through you know what we're currently doing uh, related to science and research and then our next generation, of what they prefer to see, I think we're going to see some changes in agriculture. It'll be gradual changes. It's not going to happen overnight, but we're going to see some of these changes for sure. Do you do you think um, the, the the changes? You think there there's a way as as you look at the landscape uh, to how, how would you? I'm, try, I'm trying to articulate this question. Um, it, it, as we look forward, and you you mentioned you know that that 
family farms have to get bigger and bigger in order to to make to make it work. And you and I are both from small uh, small communities, and I don't know if your community where you came from still has their high school. Uh, mine does not. And uh, yeah, is there? What is the path forward for our rural communities? Um, how how can a and you said it's going to be gradual. What what do you see kind of as as a way to get to more more revitalized rural communities like the places where you grew up and I grew up? Ah, oh, great question. And I'm not sure I'm the expert on that. Um, I can definitely share my perspective and what I've been hearing from colleagues at other universities that I've worked with. Um, there are some rural communities who that have um, essentially met their maximum maximum production level. So from um, their population to their schools and everything. Um, unfortunately, your rural community does no longer have its school. Um, my rural community that I grew up in actually just built a brand new high school and middle school. Um, and we're seeing growth within our rural community. And so in Nebraska, so I can speak from the Nebraska perspective, there are efforts in place to revitalize rural communities, to have the next generation come back to these rural communities, um, you know, from the career opportunities and um, different growth opportunities that there are within the rural communities. And so there are other individuals that are focusing and researching on rural development and growth, and they've learned a lot over the years. And so now what they're really focusing on is what does the leadership look like in the rural communities that are that are really growing and excelling and prosperous? And what do rural communities that need some additional help and support, um, how can we provide them leadership opportunities and what do those leadership opportunities need? And so within rural communities, it goes beyond the ag production. Um, it's about what additional career opportunities there are to go back to that rural setting. And what our opportunities are there for that next generation to really um, be educated and learn and grow and prosper um, should their parents go back to the rural communities? And so if you would have asked me, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, if my rural community um, would still be would be growing today and have a brand new high school, I would have said absolutely not. But it took a vision of the next generation of leaders who are who are the current leaders of of our community of that community to say, we want to grow, we want to prosper, we want to bring back um, those former high school students to our community. What do we need to do to grow? And so it takes that vision to to keep that growth in rural communities and the right individuals will make it happen. And, and perhaps no, I there there are probably few, well, may I I don't want to overstate this, but but I would think that an ag program probably has the greatest percentage of kids graduate and go back home <laughs> than, than maybe a lot of other, uh, especially small communities, uh, than, than, other, than other programs. Like you said, several of your graduates, they, they're going back to their, uh, to their family farm. And when, when I had that group of, of Concordia Seward students here, we talked a little bit about that, how, you know, I, I think we need to beat the uh, the misconception that well, if you go back back to your hometown, you somehow failed because you didn't go to Lincoln, you didn't go to Omaha, you didn't go to the big city. Uh, no, we need people to come back to the rural to rural communities. We need the best and the brightest to to go back to our rural communities. And there there's there's a wonderful life to be uh, to be built there. And for some reason, we we've and even even farm families unfortunately speak this way sometimes. Like, well, you know, I get get you know the we can get some kids to escape from the farm. Well, it, we, <laughs> we, we need the next generation to come back to the farm. We need the next generation to come back to these small, small towns. And um, I, I, I think there's a, a change of mindset uh, that's needed in our rural, in our rural communities. Yep. Agreed. 
the the I think I want to conclude uh, our our second discussion today by um, what you you've spoken kind of a you know about changes coming. What just give as a as a professor in an ag program. What and and seeing these students working with these students, just just give us a little bit of a picture. What what do you see as the potential future of ag in the next 10, 15, 20 years, the next generation, as you prepare those young men and women to to go out, to go back to their farms, to go into agribusiness, whatever? And what what do you see as the the next stages uh, ahead for them and for for agriculture as a whole? Mm. I've used this word previously today, and I think I'm going to use it again. Um, I think technology. Technology is kind of the word that I want to leave everyone with. And um, the future of the next generation is incorporating practices related to technology. And not just not just this device here. Um, it's going to be more beyond the apps. It'll be about, you know, the genetics. How can we really capitalize what we know and understand from the genetic standpoint to um, grow more with less? And that's something that, you know, we need to feed the um, nine plus billion people in the next few years. And we've been talking about growing more with less. And I think just really capitalizing on the technologies from the genetic side and physiology side on the crops and animal side is is really important but also understanding how the next generation can work together to meet the growing needs and demands to feed the world is is of significant importance as well i was, I was gonna give this anecdote earlier you know i i remember you know, with, as far as technology goes, uh, uh, we we uh, we hauled pipe every summer. That was that was we were one of the last people to be doing pipe in York County, and uh, uh, Dad never owned a pivot, uh, and uh, so we we laid out the pipe. And I remember him with his notebook where he keep track of keep track of every every gate that he had opened and whether it had come down and come through. And uh, so, you know, uh, today he would use an app or something, I suppose, or, or something like that. Um, it Sometimes the processes may not change, um, but the technology allows you to track things. It allows you to uh, monitor your, to, to make measurables and, and allows you to, to, to see how things are, things, things work. And really, you know, something we're, we're doing, we're going to do here is we're going to, you know, you got to You got to watch things and keep track of things and see it. Well, how did it go this year? And uh, and and how is it going to go next year? And the technology can be a wonderful help in allowing you to do that. Um, you know, quote unquote, regenerative farming or whatever is not just, hey, let's go back to 1850. Uh, but it is OK, we'll use some of those older techniques. but We're going to use it with what we've learned um, since then and and put put a lot of those things to use. So so I, I think whether it's you know, whether it's alternative, quote unquote, alternative ag, whether it's uh, quote unquote, conventional ag, whatever, uh, using your tech, the technological tools to help you be more efficient uh, is going to, again, allow you to to produce more food for for the people around you. Kimberly, it was it was wonderful to have you with us today. It was such a blessing to to have you speak about uh, about the program, the the wonderful program that that is uh, getting going there at Concordia Sewer. Well, I shouldn't say just getting going. You're you're graduating people now, and uh, and to speak with us about about the current state of ag and and what we see moving into the future. It's been a such a joy to be with you. It's been such a joy to to see this relationship between what we're doing out here and what you're doing in Seward uh, develop over the past few months. And looking forward to continued interactions in the future. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Thank you. It's been a, my pleasure and a blessing. Well, friends, we we have a number of other webinars that we'll be uh, we'll be rolling out here. We'll get these posted up, and then uh, then we'll be speaking with uh, the Heath family, their homesteaders up in uh, upstate New York, and then we've got actually 
Um, so local farmers in Nebraska and Kansas that I'll be speaking to uh, sometime here in June, probably. So uh, we'll continue rolling these out and bringing more content to you. Definitely continue to share these. I've noticed that Concordia Seward community is anytime I post something about Concordia Seward, I, we get more likes on our Facebook page than for anything else. So that that, Concord <laughs> that Concordia Seward group just, uh, just is on the ball and they, they share it and they get excited about it. So that, that's pretty cool. So the Lord be with you, my friends. Have a wonderful rest of the day. God's blessings.